you, you can ask, well, how in the world can you think outside of space time? Uh, how can you even think outside of space time? But well, you can. Once you, you once you start to do it, you, you get the hang of it. And you go, oh yeah, okay. You can t think about the amplitude hedron is a geometric object. It's outside of space time entirely. It could have trillions of dimensions. Space time only has four, maybe eleven, if you're mm -hmm. screen The amplitude hedron can have trillions or quadrillions, untold numbers of, of dimensions and, and, and vertices and so forth. So this really complicated object outside of space time, and it, it's the the volumes. The volume of the amplitudehedron turns out to code for the probability, or the, what they call the amplitude, of particle interaction. So, like at the Large Hadron Collider, like you know, two quarks smashing into each other, and four quarks or four quarks coming out, or more likely two gluons and four gluons you know, spraying out. What's the probability of that kind of of scattering of that? And so, it's coded for in the volumes of the amplitudehedron. And what's interesting is that. It, it's a geometric object. It's not a polytope, but it's like a polytope. It's got facets and edges and vertices and so forth, right. and then faces of different dimensions. And it turns out when you look at the whole structure of all the, the faces and the edges and so forth, that structure itself codes for locality and unitarity, space-time and properties of space-time and quantum theory. So it's interesting. It, 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 it's a geometric object. It's static. It's just sitting there. It's this monolith beyond space-time, its volumes are the scattering probabilities or amp amplitudes, and its geometric structure codes for locality and unit properties of space-time. And then behind the amplitudehedron, even deeper they found these things called decorated permutations, right. which are the, the sort of the, the, the deepest core somehow from which the amplitudehedron gets its structure. Um, that, that codes for for these properties of objects in space time. So it's it's, but these are these these just there's no dynamics now. This it, there's these we've let go of space time. We've taken our first baby steps into the realm beyond space time, and what we see are these these monoliths that are just sitting there, you know, pregnant with meaning, but but no dynamics. So we're very much like um, you know, 2001: A Space Odyssey, where where. The, there's the monolith there, and there's the apes. Yeah. They see it. They're first scared of it, and then they pound on it, and they're screaming at it, and they're jumping all. Yeah. They, they know there's something important, but but they're clueless, and, yeah. and we're sort of in that same. We found these wonderful monoliths, but but who ordered that, and why? Why the amplitude hedron, and why is there no? Why aren't we seeing no dynamics? It's just these hmm. these blocks, these these geometric objects beyond space. Sure. Wow. You're absolutely knocking on the right doors here, and I, I've been trying to knock on those doors too. Why, why does the unlimited intelligence need to plunge itself into a four-dimensional space-time and lose sight of itself and, and painfully wake up to recognize that it wasn't just its body and it wasn't just its accomplishments and it doesn't need to compete with everybody else and it doesn't need to try to prove that I'm better or stronger or more intelligent than anybody. That it, 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 it wakes up and realizes that it can just enjoy the ride. And it's that, that whole thing of plunging into ignorance, waking up, seeing that this is just a simulation and then and letting go and then going on to the next simulation somehow is essential to what consciousness is and what it means to be. Mm -hmm. so, so my attitude is consciousness is just as important for this unlimited in consciousness to experience the world as a bacterium in my gut as it is for it to experience itself as a scientist trying to work out this theory. And, and as I look around and I look, okay, see the, the world of my cats, it, it's worth consciousness's quote unquote time to, to spend several years as a cat. And, mm -hmm. and so, so in other words, it's, it, it's very easy to again get anthropocentric and to view things only from my own particular little worldview and this is i'm i'm so important it's 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 hard but i think important to let go of that and to realize that even the ant that i stepped on this morning that was consciousness mm -hmm. doing something that was just as important as as einstein discovering general relativity right mm -hmm. it's it's just as important and and and, and just as profound so in, in other words there's Anything, any excuse that we have to make ourselves seem important or more important than others is an illusion.
for all the physicists out there, what percentage of them would you say, if you had to guess, I know this is totally a guess, would, would, would agree that space time is doomed? Well, uh, I would, it's funny, I was at a, a conference uh, a, a few weeks ago uh, at Chapman University where a bunch of physicists with, with PhDs and for work in uh, quantum theory were there and they were interested in quantum models of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so I made a habit, I mean, I was part of the conference, I gave a talk there and I, I made a habit whenever I could at the end of their talks to ask them if they, what they thought about the amplitude and space time is doomed and, 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 and to a person. They didn't know about it. They 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 hadn't they hadn't really? even heard of the amplitudehedron. And and how? <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it's because now in this little space-time four-dimensional world, we're experiencing perhaps uh, my guess is one of the cheaper headsets. I mean, one of the more trivial, low-quality headsets. This this is this is only four-dimensional, maybe eleven-dimensional. It, it stops at ten to the minus thirty-three centimeters at the Planck scale, right. it, so it's very shallow. It's not. It's not like 10 to the 30 minus 33 trillion centimeters, just 10 to the minus 33. So, so this is consciousness maybe exploring one of the more low level aspects of its, of its potential, pretty trivial aspect. My, my guess is that there are much more interesting headsets ahead, <laughs> so to speak. And um, we'll look back on this as child's play, if even that. Donald Hoffman is a professor of cognitive science at UC Irvine. He studies evolutionary psychology and consciousness using game theory experiments and mathematical models. His latest work includes a theory of conscious realism, building up our universe with a massive network of conscious agents serving as the basis of everything. Chapters are broken out below. If you got this far, please subscribe. The fate of this channel relies on you, and I hope you enjoy our conversation. Yeah, Don, I mean, I guess to start off, um, I'll say I want to share a personal story because uh, a story and an apology as well, because uh, I remember when I first learned your theory, um, your, I watched your TED talk back in 2015 or so, so about seven years ago. And um, yeah. I say an apology because if, if you were in my orbit, a family of friends, uh, I told you all about, this is all I could talk about for like a month straight, <laughs> was your theory, because I, I was just blown away by it. Oh, wow. So you like the idea that uh, evolution by natural selection would shape us not to see the truth? Exactly. Yes, that was the big I mean, that was the start of uh, me following you and your work um, in your career. And of course, you know, I've followed through and have read a lot about um, your ITP model and uh, conscious conscious realism model as well. So um, but that um, your your idea around fitness beating truth just struck me um, as such an intuitive, strong idea. And then the fact that you have just all of the the game theory simulations and the math to back it up just makes it ever more powerful. Right. And what's what's interesting to me about it is that um, there are, are brilliant researchers in my my field who clearly understand that evolution by natural selection would not shape um, vertical cognitions in general. Okay. And, and they're very, very clear about it. And, and yet when it comes down to applying that idea to everyday middle sized objects, tables and chairs, forks and spoons, or even the sun and the moon, they all stop. The, the, that's that's a bridge too far, and and I realized the logic is the logic, and we should not say that there's a bridge too far. If if the logic right. of evolution says a table is just a a symbol that we create and it's not the truth, then then so be it. I mean, my, my attitude is evolution by natural selection is our best scientific theory in this area, but that doesn't mean it's right. I mean, and I presume that we will get new theories. Hopefully, a century from now, we'll look back on our current conceptions and laugh. Yes. You know, the science will progress. That's, that's what we hope from our science. So, so we should never take our current ideas as the best. But evolution by natural selection is the best theory we have right now in this area. There's nothing that comes close to the explanatory power. And so, you know, we, we need to take that theory seriously and to take its implications seriously. That doesn't mean that we need to believe the theory. I, I don't, I think believing any scientific theory is the wrong attitude. Respecting them, respecting the genius that went into them and the hard work and the experiments, I absolutely respect them and respect that they're the, the best we have so far, but absolutely don't believe them. Um, mm -hmm. Always try to look for their limitations and then get a better and deeper theory. Mm -hmm. Yes, and as you said uh, many times in different interviews, a theory is best when 
it, it tells you exactly where its boundary lays, where, where the limit is. And then um, instead of being, say, vague or ambiguous about the boundary, a, a proper theory tells you exactly where it ends. Yeah, my, my attitude would be that th those are the truly outstanding scientific theories. A, a, a theory that can't do that is, um, it, it may be helpful, but it, it's not as good as, as you would want. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, we want a theory that tells you precisely its limitations. That's, that's wonderful when, when the theory does that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I'd love to, before we jump into actually because I do want to cover fitness speech truth, ITP, conscious realism, kind of go over those those topics and ask you a tangential ideas. But if we could take it just a step back a little bit, I actually find it very helpful. You did an interview recently with Jack from Asking Anything uh, mm -hmm. and Bernardo Kastrup. And um, like Jack, actually, who I've spoken with as well, he's a pal of mine. Um, oh. I, yeah. Uh, like Jack, I like I love to hear about the background behind the theory, the person behind the theory. Yeah. And so I know a little bit about your background. I know you started off as a vision scientist, but I'd love to hear about, I mean, like what you're like as a young person. So like as a kid, like sort of if you could go back and I know um, you've even mentioned in prior interviews, your, your father was a fundamentalist Christian minister and right. also had a master's in chemistry. So he was a man of both worlds, which is just absolutely fascinating. So if you could you tell the audience about um, a little bit about what you're like as, as a young kid and what your upbringing was like. Right. So I, I was born in an army hospital in San Antonio. Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> 1955. My dad was only 21, maybe yeah, 21 or maybe just 22 years old. Maybe, maybe still just 21. Yeah. Uh, and my mom had just turned 22. So they were, they were kids <laughs> Wow! Yeah. and they were, they were dirt poor. They didn't have enough money at the end of the month. So neighbor would give them food the last couple of days of the month because their, their army hospital, their, their army salary was not enough to support them. And so, so it was a stressful time and my dad went in there because he had emotional issues he wanted to deal with. He, he was trying to, you know, become a man and, and uh, mm -hmm. break away from his own parents and, uh, had emotional issues. So, so it was a very, it was a very stressful time for them. I was born into uh, a family of, of parents uh, who were young, um, very much in love. And, um, uh, but both, uh, my mom came from abject poverty, uh, completely abject poverty, not, not you know, outhouse when she was in high school and so forth. Wow. No, no, and so and this was in Southern California. They lived in Solana beach and they, they hunted, <laughs> For, I mean, they, 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 they lived off the land, you know, it's hard yeah. to imagine, but, but it's not that long ago. And sure. so, so she was dirt poor, but she was brilliant. She could be, she was the valedictorian or salutatorian. And so she, she found her escape in, in being very, very intelligent and, and academic. So, so they were both, they were both very, very sharp, um, both very anxious, both had a lot of issues to deal with. And, and so and both had a background in science. My mom had background in biology, a bachelor's degree, and my dad um, got a master's in chemistry and worked in high tech for, you know, what, what was high tech back then, general dynamics and used aircraft and so forth. Oh, interesting. Yeah. But he was, you know, so he, he had the intellectual chops to do the, the technical work. But, and uh, my mom academically was even sharper than him. Well, she, she was, she was really quite sharp and she, Eventually was a computer programmer and in her thirties and beat all the young guys. She, she was number one in her programming class. And wow. so, so they, so they were very interesting, but, but to deal with the emotional issues, they, when I was very young, they, they got involved in, in Christian church and got really into it and mm -hmm. um, became very, very strong fundamentalist uh, Christians. And so, so I was raised in, in, in both worlds. And uh, so you, that, that's the reality, you know, you're, you're so I knew a, a world of science and, and parents who were really interested in science. And then on Sundays, I would see a completely different world where I was told to listen and just believe and say amen. And, and, and all the rules of experiments and, and back and forth logic and debating, that, that wasn't really, so it was very, very, you know, the dichotomy was, was quite striking. Sure. And, and so as a teenager, um, I, I decided I needed to sort of sort this out for myself. Um, and I decided that the, the technical question that I wanted to understand was, are we just machines? 
are human beings just machines? That, that seemed to really cut to the chase. And I figured artificial intelligence, this is back now in the um, 1970s, mid 1970s, I've said artificial intelligence was probably the way to go to really understand that. But I also wanted to understand human psychology and you know, neuroscience. And so, so I ended up going to MIT in the artificial intelligence lab um, and what's now the brain and cognitive science department um, and studying both. To answer the question, you know, are we just machines? And you know, AI sort of gives you the best idea. Well, if you try to make a machine, how close can it be to human? Is there anything that's missing that, that humans, right. the machines, uh, don't have? And, and yeah. so, so I was very much interested in, in, in that. Now, I, I didn't think we're machines, but I. But you don't know until you try, and I, you know it's sort of fun. I mean, it's really interesting technical challenge. And so when yeah. I was at MIT, where you, of course you can't take on the big question like that for your PhD. You need to take on something specific. Sure. Yeah. So I, I looked at specific problems in visual perception. So can we build machines that mimic how we see in three D and how we see motion? And so I, I focused on motion perception and object perception in three D. Um, but but my and you know you have to do that to get something specific that's that you can say yeah i did this and and yeah either it was good or good enough or not to to get your, your doctorate but the, my eye was always on the prize of the bigger question which is you know what is perception more generally could machines more generally be uh, claimed to actually have perceptions and do they have conscious experiences in their perceptions or or not so that was the bigger question but you know you, you can't just jump in and say, you know, I'm going to study consciousness. You know, you, you got to, you got to do something specific. Otherwise, sure. you just, you know. but eventually, you know, at some point you have to, you know, life is short. So even if you don't feel like you're completely prepared, you know, if you don't do it sometime before you're 80, you're not going to do it. So, so you got to, you just have to, you yeah. just have to jump in there and do it. Even if you're, if you're not prepared. So I've been looking at, at, at consciousness per se. I mean, once I got tenure, it was safe to start to to really uh, reveal what I was interested in, go after it. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, cool. And I love, I mean, and also it forms, it formed your later work too, because you, and I looked through your publication list and you have publications going back to like maybe late seventies, early eighties, that period. Early and 80s. so your visual work, of course, and I think I've watched many of your presentations. So um, I think when you start them off, you oftentimes you start with optical illusions right. to try to help the audience into it that, we're reconstructing what we see, you know, it's not as though there's a universe, there's a landscape of facts and that we, we see that landscape of facts and then act. It's like, no, <laughs> it's the other way around. You know, we, we, based on our ethic per, perhaps, or based on uh, fitness, we, uh, that, that, that decides what we see, you know, it's pre-filtered. It's, it's pre, it's pre-done for us. That, that, that's right. And so, there's there's two two directions to come at that from the evolutionary point of view to say that that you know we've been shaped not to see the truth mm -hmm. um, but but even if you just ignored the evolutionary stuff when you actually try to build a vision system for example like so I I've got a I've got two video cameras that are bringing data in I've got a, 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 a supercomputer somewhere that and I want to build a, a vision system that's going to you know drive a car. And I, I wanted to find the pedestrians so that I don't run over the pedestrians. I want to see stop signs. I want to see the depth to various. So when you when you look at that problem, you realize that the you know it's just a hard nosed thing. You've got two image sensors, you know, two video sensors, right? Maybe they're you know a thousand by a thousand pixels or something like that, and you're getting uh, the brightness or RGB values that so you're getting several million numbers mm -hmm. <laughs> you're getting a few million numbers and that's what right. you're a two-dimensional array of numbers there are no objects there are no people there are no stop signs there are just millions of numbers that that when you look at them it's just an overwhelming mess you have to start with that overwhelming mess of numbers and realize that in front of you there's a boy on a bicycle that you need to break for um, or you'll hit him right. how do you go from the numbers to that three-dimensional world and and so there's no boys and bicycles in the numbers you have to create them the boy and the bicycle and the depths out of those numbers and so you realize you know even even if you knew nothing about evolution but natural selection you realize 
well, we're, we're constructing everything that we see. You, you have to construct it. And when you build real working AI vision systems, you, there's no question about it. If you, if you don't construct it, you cannot see it. This is, you only see what you construct. Sure. And, and evolution basically then reveals that our constructions are not reconstructions of reality. They're constructions, period. We're, we're just constructing what we need to construct to do what we need to do to stay alive like long enough to produce. But, but the idea that we're reconstructing reality as it is, um, is from an evolutionary point of view, probability zero. Right? So given evolutionary theory, right. probability that we're reconstructing the truth is precisely zero. Got it. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, just for context as well, I did um, on my channel, I did a three part series on your FBT theorem. Oh, great. So yeah, I should have maybe mentioned that at the start. Yeah, I think I may have included that in my email to you. Um, oh, right. That's right. Um, That's right. Originally, but obviously you under, you created it, so you understand it better. You're the last person that needs to watch that in the world. But for any folks who are watching this and want uh, a primer, well, first in the description of this video, I'll link to your TED Talk, obviously. And there are a few other lectures of yours that are uh, some of my favorites that I'll link as well for folks that want to dive deeply into it. And then I did a, a three-part series where I, um, I I basically tried to create a um, an, anal an analogy for for your FPT theorem, where I um, you know uh, using say different territories with different amounts of water and the perceptions of two different agents, one seeing truth, one uh, shortcutting just a fitness, right. and and so it's it's provided with visuals and it's. Um, it's, it's linked below and there's three parts. So the first part is that, the second part is common objections to your theory. So say uh, 10 of the most common objections or so. And then the third part is um, potential implications of your theory. And that one becomes, you know, it goes sort of a link I'd say to eventually covering uh, ITP and conscious realism. We go into uh, quantum error correction and the oh, holographic cool. principle as well. Yeah. Um, okay. I look yeah, forward to watching those. Great, thank you. Yeah, please. I mean, well, that would be a, a dream. I mean, this is a dream. Talking to you today is um, absolutely a dream come true for me. And uh, if you would check those out and if you get your stamp of approval, that'd be awesome. I thought this would actually be a good time because I do have some questions still about FBT and I think sure. maybe even clarifications, you know, because I feel like I think I understand the model very well. But uh, if you could clarify or clear up any, any, you know, any places where I have it wrong, that'd be super helpful. Um, and so I, what, one of the things I'm, I'm pretty sure this is the case, but uh, FPT is proven, I believe, in two ways, right? You have the, the millions of evolutionary game theory simulations and separately the formal math by Chetan Prakash. Is that correct? Right. I would say that the second is the proof and the first is not a proof, right? The simulations oh, okay. are never a proof uh, in general, but, but simulations were were compelling evidence that made me take it seriously and, and then go to Chaitan and say, I think that there might be a proof here. <laughs> sure. Okay. Awesome. That's, that's super helpful to, uh, into it. Um, and then I'd say, yeah, it's just a, a couple of questions here. So you say that after 30 States, um, it's all over for the truth, right? You reach a point where, um, as the number of world States approaches infinity, actually, as it approaches one, the chances that we see truth or these, uh, in, in the in the math uh approaches zero it goes to zero but but after 30 states it there's some it's, it's a very high likelihood that we're not seeing truth anymore right yeah the odds are astronomically against seeing the truth gotcha and is that can you help folks into it this took me a long time to try to understand why this would be the case but can you help the audience into it why there is this gap between you know say objective realities or the base of what's going on and and, and what we're experiencing from an evolutionary point of view on that or yeah or... I guess for for an evolutionary point of view or perhaps you know analogies or uh yeah whichever way I think you you would sort of um help say a, a lay person um you know cross that gap between hey you know this these things feel solid to me this table feels solid this microphone is solid right what do you mean I can't you know experience what the base is that's right. So for, I'll, I'll start just from the point of view of evolution of natural selection. Again, with the proviso that, that I think it's a wonderful theory and we should you know, take it seriously, but I'm not saying that I'm dogmatic about the theory at all. And I expect it hopefully to be replaced at some point. Sure. For the better. 
with a better theory. But so I'm using evolution not because I'm doctrinaire about it, but because that's the best science we have right now. And that theory um, brings in this notion of fitness payoff functions that for for different actions that you might take in the world, you will get different consequences that affect your likelihood of survival and your likelihood of reproducing. If I go out and eat um, poison mushrooms, my chance of reproducing gets dramatically reduced, right? So, so there's, so these fitness payoffs depend on whatever objective reality is. So I'll call that the world, but it's not necessarily a space time world that we see. It's just some abstract reality. So, but I'll call that the world. And it depends on the organism, like me versus a cow versus a horse versus a, you know, a turtle. And the action, feeding, fighting, fleeing, and mating, the mm -hmm. famous four Fs. Four Fs, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and the state of the organism, right? Am I hungry? Am I sated? What, what, what is my state? So, so fitness payoff functions are complicated functions, right? They, they, they depend on the world, the organism, the state, and the action. Um, but and if, if you think of it like a, a game, a video game, right? Where to play the game, you need to get as many points as you can at the current level without getting killed. If you get enough points, you go to the next level of the game. Well, in, in evolution, it's like that. You, you're, you're collecting as many fitness payoffs as you can, or, or at least more than the competition. Right. All you need is more than the competition. And, and if so, then you don't go to the next level of the game, but there's a good or a better chance that your offspring, your DNA, will go to the next level of the, of the game. And so, so the question is, from an evolutionary point of view, what do you need to know perceptually to beat the competition in terms of passing on your genes to the next generation. Do, do you really need to know the truth about reality or, or, or not? And, yeah. and it turns out that when you look at these fitness payoff functions, you ask, well, could, I mean, if I'm going to be shaped to see reality as it is in some respect, I'll be shaped by these fitness payoff functions, right? That they're gonna to have to be the, the things that shape you know, that, that kill me if I'm not seeing the truth and let me survive if I'm seeing the truth and so forth. So do the fitness payoff functions actually themselves contain any information about the structure of the world? Do they, do they, I mean, they have to know, quote unquote, know something about the structure of the world or they couldn't possibly tune my senses to be tuned to the structures in the world. Yeah. And so that's the technical question that Chaitan and I and our collaborators looked at. And, and the answer is, the probability that a fitness payoff function contains any information about any particular structure, like a total order or a metric or a topology, um, is minuscule and, and goes precisely to zero as the number of states in the world, the number of payoff values gets larger. So, so the answer is evolution couldn't possibly tune our sensory systems or any sensory systems to any truth in objective reality because the fitness payoff functions don't know about the truth. But, but there's, a, so that's, that's the technical reason, but there's, there's a, an intuitive reason that I think is very helpful as well. Why we don't, aren't shaped by evolution to see the truth. And that is that evolution shapes sensory systems to guide adaptive behavior. And, and by that, I mean a behavior that keeps you alive long enough to reproduce successfully. That's adaptive behavior. So, so everybody who understands evolutionary theory would say, agreed. Evolutionary theory guides the, the development of, of sensory systems, uh, shapes them to um, guide adaptive behavior. Most of my colleagues, and again, these are my most friends and brilliant colleagues. I mean, they're, they're, they're many of them geniuses, but most of them assume, and I understand why, I mean, it seems very natural to assume that well, to guide adaptive behavior, it would be useful to see the truth, right? So evolution, surely it guides adaptive behavior, but the way it does it is to shape sensory systems to see at least the truths that you need, not, not all the truths, but, but the truths that you need. And, and that's where our intuitions go wrong. I mean, it turns out that seeing the truth gets in the way. And, and the, I think the analogy that helps the most is if you're playing a video, like a virtual reality video game, like Grand Theft Auto with the VR headset, you know, what you're seeing is a, you know, 
you know, a red Mustang and your dashboard and the steering wheel and the gas pedal and so forth, your windshield. That's what you're seeing and that's what's letting you play the game. And you're, you're using all those visuals to um, you know, react quickly and try to beat the competition that's in the, the Mustang and the Ferrari and whatever else you're, you're racing against. But what you're really doing in this metaphor is precisely toggling millions of voltages in a computer in, in a precise sequence. That's what you're really doing. And, and if you got the toggling at all wrong, Mm -hmm. Your car would crash. You, you, you would, you, so you've got to get millions and millions of voltages toggled in exactly the right sequence or you're dead. Well, mm -hmm. okay, so which would you rather do? Turn a steering wheel or have to toggle millions of voltages directly? Right? It's clear what's going to be the better way to survive in the game. And, and sort of, so not seeing the truth mm -hmm. can actually help your survival in the game. And that's the point is that in the game of life, which is to stay alive long enough to reproduce you know, from an evolutionary point of view, um, you can either look what's under the hood and try to toggle all the voltages, whatever it is, good luck, or you can just play the video game. And that's what evolution did. It, it, it hid the truth, gave you the video game version so that you can control the truth um, very, very quickly without having to know all the gory details. And so that's why it's actually more fit not to see the truth. So that means space and time. The sun and moon and stars, physical objects, have no clear relationship to objective reality in the sense that, space, that space, the very notion of space and right. time is probably not relevant to the nature of objective reality. Space and time are not fundamental ideas. They're just a data structure. The sun and moon and stars are merely objects inside that data structure. To, to be to make the analogy clear, if you in the VR game, there are no red Ferraris in the supercomputer. If you right. looked inside the supercomputer, you would not find a steering wheel, no red Ferraris, nothing like that. You'll see something entirely different. The whole language of the video game is just the wrong language for reality. So basically, everything that we thought was the absolute truth is not only not the absolute truth, it's even the wrong language to describe the truth. That's how far off we are. So that's, yeah, that's but it's, yeah. it's sort of scary because now you sort of, I, I know you, all of a sudden you feel naked. It's like, well, then what's out there? I like feel completely vulnerable yeah. to whatever might be out there. Sure. Yeah, I agree. I love that analogy. I think the Grand Theft Auto, the video game analogy it gets the point across the best and I think the clearest for folks because you can kind of grok that. And then, of course, you do the the VR on top of it is just like another layer of immersion that's available. And yes. one thing that's interesting, I think that's um, very important to point out to people who are interested in this, um, is that this doesn't include any additional, say, cost required to calculate the truth. Because I believe in your initial, one of your initial papers, you had a cost of information per bit that you were calculating, right. but then you, but then you removed that because it wasn't even needed in the model, right? Exactly right. We did that in the initial simulations because we, you know, initially, I thought that evolution might not shape organisms to see the truth, but I wasn't sure. And my my initial insight about why it might not shape us to see the truth was sort of shallow. I just thought, well, it's going to take too much time and too much, uh, you know, too much energy to compute the truth. So just in terms of, you know, doing things on the cheap, fast and cheap, um, maybe we wouldn't see the truth. And, and that, that turns out to be true, but, but it wasn't profound. When we did the simulations and my graduate student and I were looking at them, Brian Marion pointed out something. He was my graduate student at the time. He pointed out that what was really going on was that the fitness payoff functions were, were not homomorphic to the truth. They, they weren't right. preserving the information. And that seemed to be what was going on. And I looked at that and I said, you're, you're right, Brian, That's, that, that, that seemed to be. So it was that idea that we got from the simulations that I took to Chaton, and that became the heart of the, the theorems. So it turned out that the stuff about, you know, doing it fast and cheaply, yeah, that, that's true, but it's, it's uh, you know, sort of yawn. It says you know, anybody could imagine that. But this thing that the fitness payoff functions almost surely don't have the information about the truth. That was the exciting discovery. And that's why we do research. I mean, we go in with intuitions and we, we get surprised. That's fun. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think another analogy that's, uh, well, not even an analogy. I mean, just the truth about our perceptions that really cuts deeply because it seems so 
I mean, it's it's a part of our moment to moment existence, of course, is uh, I think Yosha Box is something to the degree there are no colors in the universe, right? Yeah. We only construct the color in our in our brain, you know, in our brains that, that we think right now, right? We'll talk about that later. Um, uh, sort of the the order in which that happens. If you take a reductionist approach, it's our brains that are creating this color. But um, you know, when you when you show people that we're only looking at a narrow band of the electromagnetic uh, electromagnetic spectrum, you know, between four hundred and seven hundred nanometers, something like that, you know, I think it really clicks for folks that oh my goodness, what I thought was actually happening no my, my my conscious experience is making the colors because it's most fit to do so that, that, that's right so we see just a narrow band of the possible electromagnetic spectrum but but of course this this result from evolution goes even deeper it says that space time itself is not fundamental mm-hmm. and that therefore the very notion of light is not fundamental because light itself is just a particle in space time Technically, physicists right. would say it's an irreducible representation of the Poincaré group of symmetries of space-time. But so when, when space-time goes, so does light. And all the particles inside space-time, they're just representations of the symmetries of space-time. So, so even mm-hmm. that analogy is good, right, to say we only see from 400 to 700 nanometers. So right. there's this narrow window. But, but there's the deeper thing that, that the very notion of light itself is an artifact of our representational system. And even yeah. that is not the truth. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah, you have to like keep pushing it further. You, it's like don't stop with your logic there. Go, go further. Go further. And that's yeah, what I love about your the way the way you think about these kinds of things. Another thing I think about, and I haven't really heard you discuss this in too many interviews, so I'd love to hear your, your thoughts around it. Is a sort of this map territory relationship mm-hmm. that that kind of like well, it's 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 key to the problem. And I think about uh, you're familiar with probably Gregory Bateson. Mm-hmm. Uh, and his work, yeah. Um, well, he has, um, he, has, he has a quote from one of his books that talks about um, this idea of like, if you had someone go out with like a measuring stick uh, to, to like out to a field or something and to measure it, and then they went home and went on a piece of paper and wrote down what they saw on the field, what you end up having, what you end up realizing, it's just, it's just maps of maps of maps, and that you can never quite get to the actual thing we're always stuck with this this process of representation between scales right and yes. i mean it seems like almost an infinite regress like there's there's it's just not going to be possible to get there that, that, that's right so well, there's a couple of very important points there the map and territory idea typically when we think about a map in the territory we think that you know the map that i'm using to you know drive to some place uh, and get there successfully um has it's not the territory but there is some useful uh, similarity between the map and the territory right Right. i the the picture of streets in my map is in some sense a good depiction of the actual relationship among the streets in the actual territory that i'm trying to drive through but the evolutionary maps that we have are entirely different. They're, they're not like a map to the territory where there's some kind of um, clean relationship, like a, like a scaled down version. So my map is, you know, 300 to one or something like that. You know, the real world is 300 times bigger than, but the, but the, the organization of the streets maps the organization of the real streets and so forth. Mm-hmm. In, in our maps from evolution, that's not true. Basically, um, the map in no way resembles the territory. There is no, at least that's that's a theorem of evolution. The probability that the map in any way is a guide to the territory is zero. So our maps are not guides to the territory of, of, of objective reality at all, according to evolutionary theory. Now, again, evolutionary theory is not the final word. And I hope, we hope to have, but, but given that theory, our maps are absolutely no guide to the territory. Now, I would love to have a deeper theory in which there could be some relationship between our perceptions and objective reality so that our our perceptions could be at least a fallible guide to some aspects of objective reality. But that deeper theory would have to show how evolution of natural selection comes out as a special case and why that special case of evolution logically entails that we wouldn't see reality as it is. So in other words, 
that would actually end up being a false conclusion of evolutionary theory that comes from certain of its limitations that we can only see in this broader framework. So that's, that's one thing I'm working on is to get a broader framework in which evolutionary theory comes up as a special case. And, and some of the predictions of evolutionary theory then are artifacts of its limitations and not insights into reality. But having said that, evolutionary theory as it currently stands says the map almost surely with probability one does not resemble the territory in any respect. And right. that's just what we get from evolutionary theory. Um, in terms of the infinite regress that you mentioned, and there's, there's only maps all the way down and so forth. I, I think that's that's even deeper, and that's really important. It, it comes from Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Sure. It basically yeah. says, um, no matter how detailed your mathematical description is, um, he can always show you a new truth that um, is true in your framework but cannot be derived from your mathematical framework. Right. And if you add that new truth to your mathematical framework, he says, well, now I'll give you another one. And this goes on forever, which, which means that there is no scientific theory of everything. Mm. This brings a fundamental humility into our work as scientists. What we can never, if we ever talk about a theory of everything, it has to be with a wink and a nod because it isn't the absolute theory of everything. And you know, if we don't do it with a wink and a nod, we'll look pretty silly to our to the scientists a century from now or five centuries from now. They'll look back like we look back on the people who believe in flat earth and, and just assume that they were right. Well, we look back and we go, OK, what were the psychological and intellectual problems that they had that kept them from opening mm. up and seeing this deeper idea? Why, why were they so dumb? Right. Yeah. And so if we don't want to look dumb to future generations, we, we should just right up front say, here are the best theories we have so far. Of course, they're not the truth. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're, then you won't look so dumb. Right. Right. Yeah. And also, by the way, you won't be um, stymied in your search for new ideas. If you think you have the truth, then there's very little motivation to uh, find out why you're wrong and where you need to go. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to, I do want to return to Gödel's incompleteness theorem. That's on my list of things I want to ask you about. But while we're on sort of um, still FBT and this map territory relationship a little bit, are you familiar with um, the neuroscience, neuroscientist Eric Howell? Uh, a little bit, but yeah, what aspect of his work? Yeah, he, so he's, uh, he's one of my favorite neuroscientists. He's, he's a pretty young guy. He worked with uh, Tononi on integrated information theory. Uh, but he has his own work. I believe he started at Columbia now. I think he's affiliated with Tufts. I'm not quite sure where he is now, but uh, he's great. And actually a great fiction writer as well. He wrote, wrote a book about um, this quasi-biographical, but I mean, it was mostly a sensational book about a murder mystery and stuff like that. That's really quite good. But um, but separately, his he has a concept he calls causal emergence, which uh, the paper, the title of the paper is uh, When the Map is Better Than the Territory. Okay. And he claims that um, he uses the concept from um, like Sh Shannon's um, like causal capacity concept, I believe, uh, to prove that sometimes the macro scale of a system can be more informative than the micro scale of a system. So uh, I think the way to intuit it, I believe this is correct. I hope this is a correct representation of his work, but that information flows between micro scales and macro scales they're either lossy or at best lossless. Um, so few reductionists, few reductionists would say, although I guess you could argue emergence creates a different dynamic there, that information flow yeah, between the scales, you either lose something in terms of information or at best you just kind of maintain the information that's had. You don't really gain more information. But he claims that, and I believe it's because of say like uh, Markov blankets or black boxes that um, the macro scale can actually give you more like utilitarian information than you could get from all the micro scales added up. Yeah, no, I, I know, Eric, we, we've talked um, on, oh. on, on Skype and, and, and so forth. Oh, cool. And, and he, no, he's, a, he's a brilliant guy. And I think he's, uh, yeah, he's at Tufts uh, um, doing some interesting work there as well as writing a novel. Um, mm -hmm. he, well, and of course, his his background was with Tononi doing the integrated information theory, where it was about these causal structures and and how 
having the right causal structure um, might lead to uh, the emergence of consciousness. Uh, mm -hmm. and so that was sort of the, the influence. And I, I certainly think that it's really interesting and, and valuable to look at the multi-level analysis of complex interactive systems. Absolutely. And in my own work with conscious agent networks, I'll, I plan to do that. And so the kinds of ideas that uh, Eric is talking about there will, will be the kinds of ideas that, that I'll be interested in with the with the agent network, which are outside of space time. I will just say, though, that um, within space time, physicists are saying that um, that reductionism is doomed. Right. So mm -hmm. so the whole reductionist goal with, of within space time has really come under um, scrutiny and, and has in fact been shot down. We, we actually know the limits of it. And so my own take about the notion of causality is again, like with the video game with, with Grand Theft Auto. Right? If, I'm, if I turn the steering wheel in Grand Theft Auto and my car goes left, I could say, well, it's the, 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 the steering wheel going to the, the going the counterclockwise on the steering wheel is causally responsible for my car turning left. And, and that's a, a useful thing to say within the game. Mm -hmm. Strictly speaking, it's false. The, the steering wheel has no causality at all. There's no, so what we have in a good user interface is a useful fiction of causality. Sure. But not true fix, but not true causality. If I drag an icon on my desktop or my computer to the trash can, my file will be deleted. And so I have this fiction, a useful fiction right. that the movement of the icon to the trash can caused my file to be deleted. But if you think about it, and of course, the movement of the icon on the screen had no causal effect on the actual deletion of the file. That was just a useful guide to me to do something. And it triggered a causal sequence. But the motion that I saw on the screen is not the cause that led to that effect. Sure. And the same is going to be true in space and time. So, so I'll, I'll say this. On evolutionary grounds, I claim that no physical objects have any causal powers, period. No. It's all a useful fiction inside a VR headset of space and time. Mm. And, and, and physicists are now saying that reductionism is doomed. And, and and even the very notion of causality becomes very, very difficult to, to even define because I, right. I'm planning, it, it, it does, it, it, it's in fact not true of objects in space and time. Yeah, and you're, um, that's something that I've heard from other folks as well, that there's no one definition for causality even, that the, there's no consensus on what causality is. But did you, did you say no, there's no causal powers within space-time? Absolutely. No causal, wow, that's interesting. That's yeah. right. No object in space and time has any causal powers huh. um, because all these first, none of the objects are homomorphic to the truth. <laughs> right. But couldn't they be homomorphic to, so when we say like, let's say map territory, right? So right. our perceptions are say maps. And I, I think I, well, let's say the territory isn't based reality. Let's say territory is a fitness landscape, right? A, that's, which I think is, uh, is that going along with you with what you say? That's fine. I would, my intuition is that there are, there are things that happen within this fitness landscape that do seem causal that like I do, I, I push on this and, you know, it has a reaction, right? Um, at least, you know, locally. And I understand, and I'm very much with, I'm very much with you on the idea that, you know, be, behind this veil, <laughs> that there is something else going on that's, 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 that has an impact, you know, or something that we have, don't have that direct access to. But it is hard for me to grok that at a local level, there's no, no causality. Right. So here, here, here's an So believe it or not, I'll, I'll, I'll maintain this. <laughs> that, oh, that, no. I mean, that's your theory. I, I, that's right. I want to hear it. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> so, so the idea is that um, physical objects don't even exist when they're not perceived. It's just that simple. So this is, in some sense, what the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded for to three physicists this year, was right. local realism is false. And it is because realism is false. Particles like electrons and so forth have no real values of position or momentum when they're not observed. Right now, I have no neurons. If you looked inside my skull, 
you would see neurons, but you would create those neurons on the fly. You would render them when you looked. But, but so neurons cause none of my behavior and none of my conscious experiences. Neurons are causally impotent because simply neurons do not exist when they're not perceived. And that's true of the sun and the moon and the stars. Uh, these are fictions that we create when we look. There is some objective reality. And it, it, it's a very complicated reality. Um, we create a four dimensional space time world with objects in it when we in interact with that reality. And those are fictions that we make up on the fly. And so they have the, the, the only way that you could say that they have some causal influence is that they guide my behaviors. They inform my behaviors, but they're not causal in the sense of, you know, the white ball hit the eight ball and knocked it into the corner pocket kind of causality. Not at all. Gotcha. Okay. I think I'm getting, I think I've shortened the gap as to where we had. Okay. Got it. That's super helpful. Um, okay. Also, I have so much other stuff to cover. So while we're on this topic, the amplitohedron, which you've talked about a lot and Neymar Kanyamed's great work there. Um, I've drawn a lot, a lot of study as to, I haven't listened to or watched his lectures. I know he has quite a bit, like quite a few lectures on, on YouTube, uh, that I have to sit through and be very confused by for most of the duration, I'm sure, because <laughs> they're very complex. But, um, but I do know, you know, a few things about it, you know, that it's, um, related to a geometric object that, um, helps to calculate the scattering amplitudes in quantum field theories, right? That's Whereas it would usually take hundreds of pages of, 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 of calculations and Feynman diagrams, things, things like that. He can now, within a couple, within like one or two lines, I think even of, of calculations, explain the scattering amplitudes, which is, seems like a massive achievement. Um, one thing I would love to see, and I haven't seen it from NEMA or anywhere else on the internet, but uh, a great visualization for how that works, like the amplitohedron itself, and how it how it condenses um, all the work needed to calculate those scattered amplitudes. I'm a very visual person. I think a lot of people, uh, if you if you do um, by chance uh, check out my videos, you'll notice I just throw tons of visuals at the audience because right. I just feel like it helps to get a variety of different ways to look at at a thing. And if, if something that's in motion is oftentimes better than just a static image, right? It's kind of I agree. It builds, it helps the intuition pumps go. Um, can you help folks? I mean, beyond what I just said about the amplitudehedron, I'm actually, I should have probably let you define it. Uh, what else, what else is being learned from the amplitudehedron and um, how else, I guess, could we explain it to help a, a, lay, a lay audience understand that better? Right. So what the physicists like Nima are saying is that space-time cannot be fundamental. Space-time is doomed. So they, independently have come to the same conclusion that we get from evolution that space time and its objects cannot be fundamental yeah can i ask you a quick question don like what would you say if you had to guess i know there's probably hasn't been a poll done but for all the physicists out there what percentage of them would you say if you had to guess i know this is totally a guess would would, would agree that space time is doomed well uh i would it's funny i was at a, a conference uh, a, a few weeks ago um, at Chapman University, where a bunch of physicists with, with PhDs and for work in uh, quantum theory were there, and they were interested in quantum models of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so I made a habit, I mean, I was part of the conference, I gave a talk there, and I, I made a habit whenever I could, at the end of their talks, to ask them if they, what they thought about the amplitudehedron and space-time is doomed, and, 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 and to a person, they didn't know about it. They, they, they hadn't they haven't really? even heard of the amplitudehedron, and and how? <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it's because um, physics is a very, very big field, and quantum physics is a very, very big field. In in scattering amplitudes, um, you, of course, if you take a basic physics course, you're going to you know, quantum field theory. You're you're going to so see scattering amplitudes, but you'll see the Feynman diagram approach to it, and that's what you're going to learn. It's only those who are specialists in high energy physics. So it's the particular niche of high energy physics, mm. where you're actually having to compute these things day in and day out, and you know, for, for your, your work, that you then really pay attention to this and so forth. So, so what's what's striking is, most of the physicists aren't aware of, of the amplitudehedron and, 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 and most are, are not aware, even that, that space time is doomed. Um, mm -hmm. 
So it's a, it's a small, but, but those who have studied it, so the physicists for whom that is their, their territory, um, it's pretty clear. Um, mm. So David Gross, um, uh, Nimar Khani Hamed, and, and uh, Ed Witten and so forth, they're, they're the, the, the luminaries in this area that have said that, that space and time cannot be fundamental, or, or space time cannot be fundamental. So that's, and it, it, it'll catch on. I mean, it, it, it will spread. If you think about, you know, in 1905, it was over for Newton. Right, right. That, that was the end of Newton. But in 1922, the Nobel Prize Committee made made it very clear that Einstein's Nobel Prize was not for relativity theory. It was for his work on the photoelectric effect. Right, so it, right. it takes a while, even though Newton was dead at that point in, in terms of being a fundamental theory. And of course, Newton is very much alive in, as a practical model for, you know, you know, sending you know, rockets into orbit and so forth. It's a wonderful model. But in terms of a fundamental model, no, it, it's dead. And that happened in 1905, but it took a long time for the rest of the community to to understand that. And and so space time is dead. Space time is doomed. It, it, it's over. And, mm -hmm. you know, it'll take a few decades for the whole physics community to to really recognize that. And you know, so what what Nima and these other geniuses have done is to say, you know, they don't say, oh, they, you know, what do we do? Space time is dead. Everything, you know, they say, what's beyond space time? So they're, and, and it turns out, you, you can ask, well, how in the world can you think outside of space time? Uh, how can you even think outside of space time? But you can. What once you, you once you start to do it, you, you get the hang of it. You know, oh yeah, okay. You can t think about the amplitude hedron is a geometric object. It's outside of space time entirely. It could have trillions of dimensions. Space time only has four, maybe eleven, if you're a string theorist. Mm -hmm. The amplitude hedron can have trillions or quadrillions, untold numbers of, of dimensions and, and, and vertices and so forth. So this really complicated object outside of space time, and it, it's the the volumes, the volume of the amplitude hedron, turns out to code for the probability or the, what they call the amplitude of particle interaction. So like at the yeah. Large Hadron Collider, like, you know, two quarks smashing into each other and four quarks or, or quarks coming out, or more likely two gluons and four gluons you know, spraying out. Hmm. What's the probability of that kind of, of scattering of that? And so it's coded for in the volumes of the amplitude hedron. And what's interesting is that it, it's a geometric object. It's not a polytope, but it's like a polytope. It's got facets and edges and vertices and so forth, right. and then faces of different dimensions. And it turns out when you look at the whole structure of all the, the faces and the edges and so forth, that structure itself codes for locality and unitarity, space-time and properties of space-time and quantum theory. So it's interesting. It, 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 it's a geometric object. It's static. It's just sitting there. It's this monolith beyond space-time. Its volumes are the scattering probabilities or amp amplitudes, and its geometric structure codes for locality and unit properties of space-time. And then behind the amplitude hedron, even deeper they found these things called decorated permutations, right. which are the, the sort of the, the, the deepest core somehow from which the amplitude hedron gets its structure um, that, that codes for, for these properties of objects in space-time. So it's, it's, but these are these, these just, there's no dynamics now, this, it, there's these, We've let go of space time. We've taken our first baby steps into the realm beyond space time. And what we see are these, these monoliths that are just sitting there, you know, mm -hmm. pregnant with meaning, but, but no dynamics. So we're very much like, um, you know, 2001 A Space Odyssey, where, where the, there's the monolith there and there's the apes. Yeah. They see it, they're first scared of it, and then they pound on it and they're screaming at it and they're jumping all over. Yeah. They, they know that it's something important, but, but they're clueless. And, Yes. And we're sort of in that same, we found these wonderful monoliths, but, but who ordered that and why? Why the amplitude hedron? And why is there no, why aren't we seeing no dynamics? So it's just these, hmm. these blocks, these, these geometric objects beyond space. Sure. Oh, I love that. I love the analogy too. It's a great movie. And um, yeah, it's a wonderful movie. <laughs> I mean, it's, yes, it's absolutely amazing. And one of the things that you say that the volume is coded, which is interesting because one of the things I learned actually from you, from your, um, I think it was one of my favorite lectures that you did. Uh, the symmetry does not entail verticality. 
lecture that you did. Uh, I love that it, you did at Institute for Mathematical Behavioral Sciences, yeah. um, which is really good. Great visuals there. But that's where I learned about the holographic principle. Actually, it was right, first right. was first through you, which um, which is one of the most incredible facets of the nature of our world that I feel almost no one knows about. <laughs> like, I mean, lay people, you know, I, I mean, I talk to my friends about this stuff. Actually, I started this YouTube channel because my friends were sick of talking to me about these kinds of topics. <laughs> I couldn't find people who would, but fortunately there's a, a big world out there of people who are interested in this kind of stuff. That's and great. now I can, I can take those ideas and not just take hold them for myself, but try to create educational materials for, for people in the world, explainer videos, et cetera. That's wonderful. Um, oh yeah, thanks. And so, but the holographic principle, you know, it's as you, you know this better than I do even, but um, you know, things depend on the information you can, uh, information you can hold within a structure depends on the surface area, not the volume. So, but you're saying for the amphitohedron, it's, it's the opposite actually. In this case, the volume is doing the coding, not the surface area. That's exactly right. So, so the, the amplitudehedron is a structure entirely outside of space time. Mm. So the holographic principle that you just mentioned is a, a feature of the space time data structure itself. And basically it, it's, it's true that you know, the, the information that you can store inside a volume of space time is proportional only to the area around that. And, 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 so that's 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 a holographic principle and and it really means that space time is something very very different than what what we thought it, it, the volumes don't hold the information it's really the surface areas that that are encoding the information so that's one aspect of the holographic principle there there is a, another meaning um that's often given in physics to the holographic principle and that is that something called the ads cft correspondence so right. the anti sitter space conformal field theory correspondence that that um a standard quantum field theory on the boundary of a certain dimension is equivalent to a, a theory of dimension one greater in what they call the bulk that includes gravity. And but that's only for anti de Sitter space. And this was something that was first discovered by Juan Maldacena back in 1997 or something like mm -hmm. that. And has, has since had thousands and thousands of, of publications exploring it. That, that that holographic principle, the one that you mentioned, is true of our world, right? That the, the, the right. volumes only hold information proportional to the areas, not the, not the volumes. But the ADS-CFT is also um, called a holographic principle, but that doesn't hold for our universe because this isn't an anti-de Sitter space. Our space time is not an anti-de Sitter space. Right, so right. physicists, well, of course, understand that, that. I'm not telling them anything they don't know. But so they use ADS CFT because it's just a, a very important recognition of this possible duality between a gravity theory on the one hand and a theory without gravity on the other of, of lower dimension. And they're hoping to get that for, you know, the sitter space, which is more like our, our space. Um, right. Yeah, because I know um, I did work in, in part three of my series on your fitness beats truth theorem. Sorry, this light is. <laughs> trying to get the light just right. Um, there were, because is this related to, I mean, does the amphitohedron have relationships with quantum error correction in any way? Or is it completely separate? Um, well, I, I'm sure the answer is yes. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know, but, but I'll put it this way. Um, quantum theory itself is not fundamental. So, so. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, yeah. Right. So, so what, what Nima will say in his lectures, like it, 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 he has a class that he gave at Harvard in, in 2019, the fall of 2019. So if you just Google Nima or Connie Hamed, Harvard lecture one, you can see his first lecture for a semester long class on this. And, and yeah. he's, he's very, very clear that um, what he intends to do is to not just get space time as emergent from this deeper, you know, like amplitude and other structures, but also quantum theory. The, the idea is that space-time and quantum theory emerge, as he puts it, joined at the hip from this, this deeper structure. So, so, so yes, uh, quantum theory, including quantum error correction t techniques, will turn out to be not fundamental, mm -hmm. but derived from this deeper, much deeper realm. But it's a deeper realm that where they don't have any notion of dynamics, right? It's just these static monoliths. So what, what physics doesn't have 
is a dynamics outside of space time. They have static objects outside of space time, but not not a dynamics. But but I you I, I would say yes to your your question. Yes, quantum error correction will come out of the the structures like the amplitude um, that are beyond space time, because gotcha. quantum theory itself, all of quantum theory, is derivative from these deeper theorems. Sure, sure. And as you po you point out, um, your theory has to everything has to come out of your theory. So space time has to come out of your theory. You, you give yourself a very high bar to clear and right. it's, and it's honest and it's a very, I mean, it's, I think it's the right approach. Um, have you seen, um, are you familiar with like Jim Gates, James yeah. Gates and his, have you seen his supersymmetric Adinkra animations? Uh, I, I know a little bit about his Adinkra theory and, 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 and but then he sees this error correcting code at the foundation of space time, he says, right. But, yeah, but I don't know about he, the, I haven't seen that animation, so I'll, yeah. I'm all ears. <laughs> I'll have to, um, I'll, I'll send it to you, obviously, and I'll include in the description of the of this link below of, of this video as well. I might even overlay in this on this video the magic of, you know, Final Cut Pro stuff I can overlay. But oh, cool. um, well, well, he claims it, that the Maxwell's. I'm just going to read off because I, I want to get this exactly right. But Maxwell's equations of electromagnetism are represented in this object, um, where they're they're basically it looks like you know um, there are all these lines that go between them and they, they they conform to certain equations. And he deforms the object, and he finds two identical subcells within the image, smashes them together, and the object equations describe electron-like objects. So he's able to make this connection between between em and electron like objects in in this adinkra kind of um manipulation which i think is really interesting it reminded it reminded me i know this is still within space time but it reminded me right. a little bit of the amphitohedron even though that's not, not dynamic of what, of what it's doing right and i think these are are different approaches um uh, in spirit to to un understanding the deep nature of reality so there are physicists that are trying to tinker with quantum theory and with maybe cellular automata, for example, and so forth. And many of these are viewed as like within space time or at the foundations of space time, like almost like pixels of space time or something like that. And then the approach that Nemo is taking is saying, um, we need to just think entirely outside of space time. So we're not trying to boot up space time from some right. elementary particles within or elementary structures within space time. We're finding these structures that have trillions and maybe trillions of dimensions even that are entirely outside of space time, but they project from trillions of dimensions down to the trivial four dimensions that we see inside space time. So, mm -hmm. so space time is a pretty trivial structure mm -hmm. um, compared to these these immense geometric objects um, that are really complicated outside of space time. So they're, they're very, very different. So my guess would be that, that, that the, the difference is that Nemo would like to show how space time and quantum theory arise, and therefore these adinkras arise mm -hmm. as a projection of this deeper structure. Sure, gotcha. And um, I'd love to ask you about too, well, we, I do want to get to ITP and um, conscious realism and stuff like that. You still have about half an hour, I think we, sure. for 90 minutes. Awesome, great. So I'm going to try to get through this section as quickly as possible. But so this is, I want to get into more, um, say, a, a, a speculation accepting zone here. So we can like speculate a little bit. We can get a little bit away from, say, the grounding so much. But do you have an intuition? And do you still meditate about three hours yes. per day? Yes. Wow. That's, I find that just absolutely incredible. I heard that you mentioned that on Kurt Jaimungle's podcast a while back, a very technical one. Well, I, 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 I can't um, really pat myself on the back for it, but I, I need to meditate. So I do. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, if I didn't, I'm, I'm pretty, um, I guess, pragmatic about it. If, if I didn't need to, I wouldn't, but, but, you know, mm -hmm. I find that to, um, to main, maintain good mental health and good emotions that 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 that's what I need to do and I'm not sure. saying everybody but um, yeah. I, that has to do with the idiosyncrasies of my background and the things I dealt with as a child so just facing all the stuff I have as a you know from my emotional stuff in my childhood that's what I need to do right now and and boy if I didn't have to do it I wouldn't but uh, I do so so I, I can't really pat myself on the back and say I'm some great sage no I'm doing it because I need to <laughs> Yeah, I got it. I understand that completely. It's funny because when I when I heard that in, in your interview with him, 
I, I meditate myself too. I, I, I've tried a bunch of different forms of meditation and I was always, I think a little anxious that I wasn't doing the right one or the right type. But what I used to, what I used to love to do and always, always come back to would, was the same kind of meditation that you do, just close eyed, not trying to think about nothing, you know, maybe my breath, maybe, but mostly just trying to, when things come up in the consciousness, let it go. You know, that's really, I've heard that from meditators or meditation teachers that the real meditation is when you are off track, correcting yourself, you know, bringing it back, you know, the error correction kind of coming back to, you know, the, the zone. That, that, that's right. It's, it's, if you're trying, then, then you're missing it. Um, mm -hmm. it it's really, it, it, it's, and if you're beating yourself up for not getting it right, then that's the thing to look at. Oh, there I am beating myself up. Mm. And so just so it's really just accepting the moment and 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 instead of saying, well, I shouldn't have been thinking about that, you know, it, all the shoulds just letting them all go and, and go, okay, here's here's the jungle of emotions and thoughts and feelings that come up. And wow, okay, it's it's a it's quite a jungle in there. And uh so I, I'll just sit there and be with it. And if I go back into silence and enjoy silence, that that's really wonderful. And some, sometimes I do. And then, then I can sit there and it's incredible when the, when the mind stops um, and you're just pure awareness, mm -hmm. and no thoughts going through there. You, you realize, um, oh, if I'm anything, that's what I am. It's that pure awareness without content. But yeah. then when, when the thoughts come back, instead of going, oh, shoot, I lost it, uh, you know, no, it's just, okay, well, that's just, just accepting that. And just in some sense, my attitude is um, we're here for the ride. Mm. Enjoy the ride. And trust the ride and don't fight it. And, and that's what you sort of learn in meditation is you're, you're learning the rules of the game of not fighting the ride. And then... Mm. To bring that into everyday life just to so i stub my toe can i it hurts can i can i accept that can i accept well, i got a flat tire in my car can can i accept that i'm angry at this person that i got you know irritated because someone cut me can i just right. just be with that okay here's here's why i'm can i do that without judging myself and can i do that without judging other people can i learn to just be with what is and um and recognize that this is where the girdles incompleteness theorem becomes very, very um, practical. All my theories about, about the world, including myself, are trivial. There is no theory of everything, and all of my theories are very, very limited. There is this unlimited intelligence that transcends any theory. And I'm, what I'm really here to do is to learn to trust that unlimited intelligence, which is what I am, and to recognize that that is what I am. And that's why we let go of thoughts is because the, the, those thoughts are limitations on the intelligence, masquerading as the intelligence. And so, so, and yet thoughts are not pointless, right? There is some point to doing science. There is some point right. to doing mathematics and doing art and doing literature and doing dance and doing all the things that we do. There's, there is, it's consciousness really enjoying all of its potentialities and possibilities, as long as you don't get attached to any of them. That, and that's mm -hmm. the key thing. It, the, the, your potential is infinite. So enjoy this part of the ride, but never cling to it because the next step will be even better if you will let it. And so it's really, it's the unlimited intelligence exploring its possibilities and learning not to cling because clinging precludes the further exploration. Mm. Yeah. That's beautiful. <laughs> that's great. No, I agree with that uh, entirely. That's that wonderful to speak about. Um, I have so many thoughts about what you just said. Okay. <laughs> First of which, um, do you, oh, let's see, I'm trying to, I'm trying to stack order this based on how much time we have left as well. The, do you think meditation can help us? I know you can't see you know, base truth or base reality, right? But do you think the practice of meditation does give us, can possibly move us in that direction? You know, even if we can't see it directly. I mean, like you said, I, and I can, from personal experience as well, 
I might, you know, meditate about half an hour in the morning, first thing in the morning, and maybe I get 30 seconds <laughs> of that whole time where you're just in it and you're at this, this level, this frequency, whatever you want to call it, it's hard to define, right? And, uh, and it's blissful and it's wonderful. And then it's over. And then, you know, like a thought pops up and you go, dang it, I had it. I was on this wave. Well, I actually view it a little bit as like surfing on like on a wave sort of. It's like how long you're sort of surfing without thinking about, you know, surfing on a wave. Um, but when I'm in that zone or that mode, and of course, you know, you can pop your brain into an MRI machine probably. And they've tested monks, you know, to see what's going on in their brains, which is fascinating in and of itself. But do you think that process, the meditative process, takes us out of the fitness landscape or moves us in the direction towards an ultimate truth? Well, I myself consciously sometimes practice just going into meditation when I need some new ideas. Um, oh, okay. And, and I find that my, my, my attitude about it right now is that you can't know the truth conceptually, but you can be the truth. Mm. Letting go of your conceptions. I mean, I, I'm not divorced from the unlimited intelligence. In some sense, all Don Hoffman is is an avatar in space time that the unlimited intelligence is using for this part of its exploration. Mm. And when it's done with that avatar, that the Don Hoffman symbol will die. But the the unlimited intelligence. And so the, perhaps all all of the story about Hoffman will will disappear with that. I mean, we don't really need that story anymore. But but the unlimited intelligence, which is what I really am. I mean, if you think about it, what happens if you let go? I, I, suppose I forget. Where was I born? Who were my parents? What did it? What What have I accomplished? Uh, suppose I forget all that. I, I I just can't remember. Here I am. In some sense, nothing important has been lost. Here I am. I I I'm here experiencing, and that's that is the the the, the reality. That's the the most important thing is is the awareness in this moment. And so, letting go of that story. Um, is, you know, what we cling to the story, but when you, when you look at it, I, actually, I've forgotten most of the stuff I've done in my life, and, and uh, I don't really care, right? If you ask me, what, what did you do on December 3rd, 2019? I don't know. Who cares? Mm -hmm. and, and in, in some sense, um, so you can't know the truth and conceptually, but meditation is in some sense being the truth that you always are by letting go of any clinging to the particular exploration that that truth is doing right now. So, so I am the truth that's exploring. Um, I don't want to mistake the little exploration I'm doing now with the deep truth that I am. Oh, that's, that's great. That reminds me of, and I know it's, this is going to um, take this in a more technical direction, but are you familiar with the, um, the explore exploit trade off? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. EETO. I think about that quite a bit in that. Foraging theory. Of course. Theory. The, the light. What's that? It's called foraging theory. Another foraging theory. theory. Right, right, right. And that we are, it seems to be a case is like most of our day to day lives, we're out there um, sort of exploring things. We have to make the trade off, right, between exploiting what we know, this kind of space around us. And then we have to make the trade off to when, when do we explore, go, go outward. And with the with the meditation, I don't want to say it's exploit. The word exploit is, you know, has all these connotations to it. But that meditation is like going inward. It's kind of like sticking with the internal Markovian kernel, right? And then the exploration is going out. Most of the time, we're out there exploring, right? And I think this is also getting you know, metaphysical. This is my own personal theory that we're in this world, this, these bodies, because we're between worlds, we're coming in here to more generally explore, right? And the exploitation is bringing us back to our, our fundamental selves, our like deepest souls, right? I, I, I agree. I think that this is um, very deep and very profound. And um, I think that what you're pointing to is, is, is right. I think that there's so much more to it that I don't understand. This is, oh, sure. this is where I really, I feel like you're absolutely knocking on the right doors here, and I, I've been trying to knock on those doors too. Why, why does the unlimited intelligence need to plunge itself into a four-dimensional space-time and and lose sight of itself and, and painfully wake up to recognize that it wasn't just its body and it wasn't just its accomplishments 
and it doesn't need to compete with everybody else and it doesn't need to try to prove that I'm better or stronger or more intelligent than anybody. that it, 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 it wakes up and realizes that um, we can just enjoy the ride and it's that, that whole thing of plunging into ignorance waking up seeing that this is just a simulation and then and letting go and then going on to the next simulation somehow is essential to what consciousness is and what it means to be and it's and and perhaps my statement that i don't understand it is just another consequence of girdles and completeness term the, the, right. the entity that's saying i don't understand it is one of these finite theories that it could never be a theory for everything right absolutely i do suspect yeah it has something to do with the this is obvious perhaps but the going having the experience is the whole point right like it has to be it has to be felt you know you can I, expl I, I talked about some of the that, that, Star Wars the other day, and it's like you can't tell someone about Star Wars. <laughs> you right, know, right. you have to watch Star. You have to watch the movie to have the experience. Right. Even better would be if you were one of the characters in the experience, having it. Right, that would be even the, the more the more immersive kind of aspect. Do you have a suspicion? I know this is. Um, feel free to speculate here. Do you have a suspicion why you know, our moment to moment ex experience is like this? When it could possibly be so different so we have say the symbols in this world we have you know the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics we have all this stuff do you have an intuition or suspicion as to why, why this is what we're doing right now um no i i suspect this is sort of my own multiverse kind of view it's not the physical sure. multiverse it's, it's yeah. really the that Consciousness has infinite potential, an infinite number of things to explore in principle, right? Gödel's incompleteness theorem says there's no limit to no end to mathematical exploration in principle. No one could ever know it all. And if, if we make the assumption that consciousness is fundamental, whatever the word consciousness is pointing to, that's, that's what's fundamental. Uh, then mathematical structures um, can only then be about consciousness. And so, mm. so all the varieties of mathematical structure then are all the possible varieties of, of conscious structures and conscious experiences. And it's in principle unlimited and never ending that exploration. And so we're just now in this little space time, four dimensional world, we're experiencing perhaps uh, my guess is one of the cheaper headsets. I mean, one of the more trivial, low quality headsets. This is this is only four dimensional, maybe eleven dimensional. It, it stops at ten to the minus thirty three centimeters at the Planck scale, right. it, so it's very shallow. It's not it's not like ten to the thirty minus thirty three trillion centimeters. Just ten to the minus thirty three. So so this is consciousness, maybe exploring it's one of the more low level aspects of its of its potential. Pretty trivial aspect. My my guess is that there are much more interesting headsets ahead, <laughs> so to speak. And um, we'll look back on this as child's play, if even that. Yes, I, I have a similar sense. And again, yeah, this is getting away from the technical stuff, but I, I have this deep sense that the, the people in my life, the, my friends and family, these personalities that I encounter in this world, that I keep encountering them a time and time again in different lives, you know, past lives, future lives, that Oh no, it's just the interweaving. We'll just we'll reconnect, and you know, it's this kind of long, unlimited uh, time we have together, but in different different bodies. Let's say. <laughs> yeah, I, I I would agree, and 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 the unity may go even deeper. I, I mean, there's a, a statement. Uh, I think it's in the Course of Miracles that says there's only one of us, mm. and I think that that's right. That there is the one unlimited consciousness, the one unlimited intelligence, and that's so. You know, Carlos and Don are that one unlimited intelligence talking to itself through two different avatars. That's what's going mm -hmm. on. And so, so yes, we'll always interleave because there's the only the one of us that's there to interleave. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's really beautiful. Um, so I'd love to let's see. We have a little bit of time left to just touch on. Oh, we you have so many great theories, and also you sent me the, the paper on the fusions of consciousness, which right. Um, I mean, we have about 15 minutes. I have plenty of time, but I've, I know you have like 15 minutes left. So um, is there anything you, I mean, we could, talk, we could talk about conscious agents for realism. We could talk about, oh, the UVIR interaction that I heard you uh, speak about with Jonathan Pajot, I believe pretty recently on, on a podcast with him. Um, 
so we have a few different options of things. What would be, I'd be best for you to speak about between, I guess, those few things, or maybe we could touch on all of them quickly. Right. Well, it might be helpful since I've been talking about this unlimited consciousness and so forth. Um, and so, so far it might sound like, okay, you know, he's got this mathematics about conscious, about you know, evolution by natural selection, but, but the consciousness stuff seems pretty out there and pretty spiritual and hand wavy. Is, is there, is, so does he just go off the rails when he's, or, or is there something more you know, scientific? And, and so, so I would like to say that we do have a mathematical model of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And for those who are interested, it's, it, there's a paper called Objects of Consciousness. That's the title, Objects of Consciousness. Yeah. So if you Google that in my name, you go, it's free, it's online, so anybody can get it. And I'll link so, to it in the description as well. Oh, great, yeah. great. So, so, so I, we have a mathematically precise model of consciousness. Now, having said that, I, I immediately have to say, of course I'm wrong, because I've just told you that any theory is not it. Every theory is just, um, will always be superseded. And what's interesting about our theory of conscious agents is that it tells you precisely its limits. And that's what you want from a scientific theory. So, so it's a theorem of our theory that whenever you have any collection of conscious agents, they also constitute a conscious agent. Right. Mm -hmm. So that entails ultimately there's one conscious agent. Mm -hmm. so, so there is one conscious agent. That was the one I was talking about, this unlimited intelligence. But suppose I start off with, you know, an infinite, a countable infinity of conscious agents. So agent one, two, three, up to infinity, countable infinity of them. Any combination, any, any collection of them, any subset of them is also a conscious agent. So that, that's what we call the power set. So the collection of all subsets right. of a set is the power set. Mm -hmm. And a guy named Cantor proved you know, back in the 1800s that <clears throat> the, the power set of, the, of a countable infinity is a bigger infinity. So we call it countable infinity Aleph zero, the, the, the Hebrew letter Aleph zero. That's the, so that's a, that is infinity, but there's Aleph one, which is a bigger infinity, which is the power set of Aleph zero. But then you can do that again. So Aleph one, we can take its power set and we get Aleph two. So the notion of infinity is that there's an infinite number of infinities. And so the one conscious agent that's entailed by our theory is the agent at the end of Cantor's hierarchy of infinities. Well, I can never get there. I can, mm -hmm. so I can study all the Aleph zero stuff, and then I can go to Aleph one and, 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 you know, and then Aleph two. And by the time I get to Aleph one trillion, you know, maybe it's time to pull out some champagne and say good work, but one trillion is basically zero compared to you know, Aleph infinity. So, so, so our theory says there is one, and you can never get there. And that's one reason I like my theory is because the theory is, is itself very, very clear about its own limits. And so, now, so we may find a, a, a deeper framework than, than our current framework. Our use is Markovian dynamics. Maybe if we generalize it to category theories that we may find a, a, a very interesting new framework that, that, that's even more powerful. We'll, we'll, we'll see. You know, but the thing is that I would want to say is, so we have this theory of, of conscious agent, it's a Markovian dynamics. And so what we have to do is to show how space time and physical objects arise mm -hmm. from this dynamics of consciousness, which is outside of space time. And what we've done in the, in the, the paper that I just sent you, and it's, it's under review right now with the journal Entropy, the paper is called Fusions of Consciousness. And hopefully within a few weeks, we'll, we'll hear what the reviewers have to say. And what we've done there is, is, is the following. The physicists like Nima, Arkani Hamed and his, his collaborators found the amplitudehedron beyond space time. And then behind that, these things called decorated permutations. They're, they're like, permutations are like shuffling cards. If you have 52 right. cards, how many ways can you shuffle them? Those are, those are the permutations. Decorated permutations are, are a technical twist that's, that, um, really doesn't change anything about the permutations, but it's needed to do what they need to do. Mm. So they found these decorated permutations, and that's the deepest thing beyond space time that they found. So what we do in this paper is we say, great. So we have a theory of conscious agents beyond space time. We want to map it into space time. And the physicists say, um, if you give us decorated permutations, we can take you all the way into space time from that. We can give you scattering amplitudes. And so I said, oh, 
Thank you very, very much. So if we can take our Markovian dynamics of conscious agents and project it down into decorated permutations, then the physicist will do all the rest of the work that take us from decorated permutations into space time. So a few months ago, I just said, well, okay, so surely someone's done that. What's the mapping from Markov chains to decorated permutations? So I did a literature search. No one. Yeah. There's no general theory of it. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, let's do it. So Chaitan, my math mathematician uh, friend and colleague for many, for 30 plus years, Chaitan, he and I sat down and did it. It, it actually didn't take that long. Um, and we extended it to arbitrary graphs. So we have this mapping from any ar arbitrary Markov chain into decorated permutations and also any arbitrated uh, arbitrary graph into decorated permutations. So now we have, so, so what we've got is this pontoon bridge now, a theory of conscious agents with a pontoon bridge through decorated permutations into space time. And what I'm thinking about right now is, okay, how, what properties of the conscious agent dynamics project to momentum? What projects to spin? So, so now, now that we have the bridge, the bridge will actually give me the guide I need to show when my ideas are wrong. Um, when I propose, is this what spin is? Well, I bring it across the bridge and see what happens. And does it give me the right answer or not? So, so I'm, I'm really quite excited now because we finally have the bridge that will actually give us feedback on how to take the features of a dynamics of consciousness into space time. I'll just say one thing that we think is probably going to come out of this, and that is that so called communicating classes um, in the Markovian dynamics, which are a class of states, is if you can get from one state to another in finite time. From, 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 so any, any state in this collection, if you can get from that state to any other state in a finite amount of time, that's called a communicating class. So you can always get there from anywhere inside the, the collection. That's called a communicating class. And, and it looks like particles in space time, like gluons, um, are projections of communicating classes of, of conscious agents, but not vice versa. Many, many communicating classes of conscious huh. agents can project to things other than particles. So particles are just one of the projections of these communicating classes. Oh, so, so that's the, that seems to be what the decorated permutations indicate. So I'll, I'll just summarize it this way. We have a mathematical model of conscious agents, and just in the last couple months, a mathematically rigorous mapping from the conscious agent dynamics through decorated permutations into space-time. If the physicists couldn't care less about consciousness, that's fine. Then what we're offering them is, is this. Behind the amplitudehedron and decorated permutations, there is a dynamical system possible, namely a Markovian dynamical system. If you don't like consciousness, fine. Just think about Markovian dynamics. Right. You'll have to then answer a dynamics of what? You'll, you, you, because this is outside of space time. So it's a, right. it's a dynamics of entities outside of space time. Mm. So, but maybe you don't want to speculate about the entities, just say there is this dynamics and that's perfectly fine too. Yeah. And I think that the, the, the path ahead will be that these dynamics are captured by these things called Mark Markov polytopes. Mm. And that, that physics will be probably for decades, studying the detailed structure of Markov polytopes. They're incredibly rich. Uh, and I think that there's going to be a lot of gold there. That's my prediction. Oh, okay. Wow. Great. We got it on, we got on record. <laughs> we got it on record. Marco Markovian polytopes. That's so fascinating. Markov Is this related to, you did a, um, a presentation at the, I think it was the Science and Non-Duality Conference so many years ago, where you, you had two formulas. It was... Um, trying to derive physics from consciousness. So it was like the conscious agent a asymptotics and then the wave function of the free particle. Is this, right. is this, this related? I mean, is this kind of part of the same work? A absolutely. So that, and that's what we also do in our paper objects of consciousness. I, I do that same kind of connection. Okay. There we're using a different tool. It's called geometric algebra. Um, and it's a very, very powerful tool. Uh, it's, but that's a whole other talk. And what, there's a specific geometric algebra that's called a, a algebra of signature two comma four, that is a, a the geometric algebra representation for space time and is, and and gives you the the, the quantum properties of, of space time. It's really beautiful. So I've been looking for a mapping from the dynamics of conscious agents into that geometric algebra of signature two comma four, and I'm still hoping to do that. 
with this decorated permutation as a, a guide to that. So, so absolutely. Okay. So that. So I'm, I'm. So we haven't got the synthesis yet, right? We we right. we finally have the pontoon bridge across, and I am just dying. I mean, I'm just just dying so to exciting. figure that. It's like a wonderful puzzle to figure out. So I'm like, I spent this morning thinking about something called Markov chain stopping times and how it. So there's all these things that are going to be. Um, really important tools for making the detailed connection of how how does momentum and spin and mass and so forth um, emerge from the dynamics of conscious agents gotcha with precision so, with precision yeah it's always important it's 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 fascinating the work that you're doing and i'm so um so we're all so fortunate that you're doing this work and one thing i want to think uh as we sort of um get to the end of our discussion here in i think about this with your career Tell me if you've thought this yourself too, that in a very meta way, it seems like you've chosen that the highest fitness path for your career, like the most, like the way to create the most utility in the world, if that makes any sense, in that all these other scientists, and like, as you said, brilliant people doing very good work, they've been pursuing this reductionist bottom up kind of approach. And you, you saw, you know, 20, 30 years ago, Oh wait, there's this whole other way of looking at it. This, you know, which I used to say that your conscious agent th theory was like um, instead of everyone else having a bottom up, you had like sort of this top down. But actually, it seems like actually it's more of like a hierarchy. I think that you that you've said it's not a it's not hierarchical. It's it's sort of like it can the dynamics can come from any direction, right? Which I really love. Um, when I tell someone for the first time, I say, think, think top down instead of bottom up. But then it's like, okay, once you get that, you can say, let's be a little more flexible as to where the directions exactly. of these laws and rules are coming for. Do you see your own career though, as in terms of that you chose like a, in a meta way, a very, fit, the most fit option. Does that make sense? Um, of course, I, I can't take any, I mean, I can't take any credit for anything, right? I didn't choose my eye color. I didn't choose my hair color. Mm. Uh, the fact that I'm alive is, is is so in some sense any kind of credit someone wants to take for for what they've done. You, everything that you have, all of us have, is is entirely a gift. And so, mm. I, you know, for me, I've, I I don't know. I'm just another guy, which is just an avatar of the one unlimited intelligence that we all are. So there's there's literally all of us doing our, so so my attitude is consciousness is just as important for this unlimited in consciousness to experience the world as a bacterium in my gut mm. as it is for it to experience itself as a scientist trying to work out this theory and, and as i look around and i look okay see the, the world of my cats well so that it's worth consciousness's quote unquote time to to spend several years as a cat and mm -hmm. and so so in other words it's it, it's very easy to again get anthropocentric and to view things only from my own particular little world view and this is i'm i'm so important it's 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 hard but i think important to let go of that and to realize that even the ant that i stepped on this morning that was consciousness mm -hmm. doing something that was just as important as as Einstein discovering general relativity right mm -hmm. it's, it's just as important and, and 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 just as profound and and so in, in other words there's anything that any excuse that we have to make ourselves seem important or more important than others is an illusion yes well that is a bigger lesson wow that is true Hmm. Yeah, I believe it's a Buddhist tenet, or I can't remember where I learned it, but uh, the idea don't side with yourself, you know, <laughs> don't, uh, don't think of yourself, don't, um, don't have one's own, say, agenda, it's, uh, it's a, there's a broader lesson, there's a broader goal out there. <laughs> yeah, it, it, in some sense, it's, um, it's not separate from the idea that there's no such thing as a theory of everything, it's, it's, my theory about what's important is just my theory and don't believe my theory is not the final word so so right now this hoffman avatar is pretty excited about decorated permutation and so forth and 
and so I'll be excited about it, and I'll 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 I'm going after it. So that's that's fun for me, um, right right now. And but to give myself errors about it, or to think that that's the most important thing, is um, to be identified with a particular theory as opposed to recognizing that I am that unlimited intelligence, and that really nothing I could possibly do could ever add anything to who I really am. I'm already that unlimited intelligence. So it gets back to enjoy the exploration and don't give yourself errors. Avoid errors, yes. But er 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 errors in the sense of being, I'm better than others. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, no, that's absolutely true. That's great. And Don, I had here, I was waiting for you to say uh, the taste of chocolate because I had some chocolate here. <laughs> Every time you were going to say, I was going to say, you know, I like to have the experience of cho eating chocolate. So I wish you were here. We could share, we could share a bar together because <laughs> I can't explain the taste of chocolate either, but uh, I, do, I do enjoy it. <laughs> and, and it's better than any theory of chocolate. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a good. You can't explain the taste of chocolate. That's right. No theory can actually make you have the taste of chocolate. Mm, and it, I'm telling you, it's so good. <laughs> um, Don, thank you so, so much. This was a dream come true talking to you today. I mean, to think that I, I learned about your theory like seven years ago, and now I'm speaking with you directly. And and th now this conversation is going to go out to the world and people can, can watch it and enjoy it. And I want to really emphasize that I'll have everything linked below in the description for people that want to go down the rabbit hole and learn more about you. Is there anything, is there anything, uh, an ending salvo you want to tell folks where they can find more uh, about you and what you're doing? Oh, uh, uh, yes. So I've got a Twitter uh, feed. So if people want to, I tweet my talks and so forth, I'll tweet this one. It's um, at Donald D Hoffman. So mm -hmm. uh, you're probably post on the thing, but yeah. So I have a Twitter, uh, usually I'm pretty good now about uh, tweeting new links to videos and so forth that come out. And, and I want to thank you, Carlos, I mean, for putting out those, those videos. I got a chance to view one of them briefly and, and the quality is very, very good. So oh. uh, thank you very much. I'll take a look at the others as well. So thank I appreciate you. Oh. you reaching out to, and having this conversation with me. It was, it was a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Yeah, it, it, was, it was great. I had a wonderful time. And I, I mean, I had a lot of other questions that I didn't quite get a chance to talk to you about. I mean. Because we, I mean, there's so much more on um, girls and completeness theorem. I wanted to talk to you about sort of the self self reference paradox that seems to be oh, wow. um, key to that. There was a lot of other big questions I had, but um, perhaps another time we we can chat and do a, a round two. I think that'd be really great. A round two would be great, absolutely. Awesome. Absolutely. Thank okay. you, Donald. Have a Take great care. day. Take care.